Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, as Jack said, my name is Shane Trawatha, uh, maker of video games and mixer of metaphors. I'm here today to talk to you about shaders and hopefully get you excited for what a creative outlet they can be. Uh, this here is me teaching my class about UV unwrapping, obviously. Um, I know the audience today is quite varied, ranging from students to industry mainstays, and it's clearly impossible in a 25-minute time slot to give a presentation on, well, anything really, but especially shaders, that is all things to all people. And I'm known for my brevity as much as 2020 is known for its calm and peaceful predictability. So let's see how this goes. Um, to that end, though, what this talk is really about is not so much showing you what's under any one particular proverbial rock, but rather it's about helping you look under your own rocks to find things that neither you or I would have imagined on our own individually, because there's a lot of rocks out there. Um, okay, so let's back this up a little bit. I'm going to assume that if you are in this audience right now, you've probably at least heard the word shader before. Uh, but even if you have, you may not actually know fully exactly what that word refers to, just vaguely something about computer graphics, maybe. Um, it's one of those words that gets thrown around so much that if you only hear it in passing, it might as well be the word magic. Um, so, you know, why is half that sphere red? Because of the shader. Why does that thing have an outline? Shader. Uh, why are the trees shader? Uh, what's in the box? Shader. Um, Incidentally, when I was looking for an image to represent Shader, uh, literally the only thing Google Images gave me was pictures of Minecraft using like RTX ray tracing stuff. I don't know, that probably says more about my own search bubble than anything. Um, all right, so, you know, it can also either sound a bit like a sort of snake oil, cure all wonder word, or a cop out buzzword that people use when they're trying to sound smart. Um, you know, both of these situations can be quite off-putting, um, especially if you're an artist. Um, the tragic irony here is that artists are the people who most need to be shader literate because shaders fundamentally define how things look. And this may come as a revelation, but artists are kind of in the business of defining how things look. Um, okay then, so what even is a shader? So this is where this talk is going to probably differ from most that would be on this topic. Uh, we could get right into the weeds about technical definitions and all the nitty gritty, but that would sort of put us right back into the off-putting territory that we want to avoid. So uh, this might sound heretical to the graphics programmers in the room, but I'm going to try and keep this as non-technical as possible. Uh, this is the not technically games conference, right? Anyway. Uh, the thing is, technical is kind of a relative term to the individual. What may sound like an oversimplification to one person uh, might also be the just the right amount of info revelation to the next person that will get them enticed to continue investigating for themselves. Um, so anyway, all you really need to know is that if you have something that you want to render to the screen, like this teapot here, uh, this is your what, then the shader uh, <coughs> The shader is what defines the how, and you need both. You need to know what you're going to render, uh, but you also need to know how you're going to render it. Um, so at this point, we need to get another word involved in the conversation, and that word is material. Uh, these two words can often be mixed up by newbies, shader and material, I mean. Um, but you can think of it this way. If a shader is like a recipe, then a material is like the hamburger that gets made by following that recipe. Uh, now, I know that most recipe metaphors tend to refer to cakes, but for our purposes, thinking of it as like a hamburger of a bunch of different things squished together is maybe slightly more useful. So the shader is the method by which you do the thing, and the material is the materials that you do the thing with. One shader can be used to create many materials, just like one recipe can be used to create many hamburgers. Um, I kind of blame Maya for making it so easy for newbies to conflate these two concepts because every time you create a new material in Maya, it also dupes the shader that the material is made from, which is kind of like going out and buying a new camera every time you want to take a photo. Um, okay, so now then what? We have our recipe, we have our things that we've made with the recipe, our materials, 
Uh, none of this is rendering a mesh yet. Uh, this is probably a good time to, as foreshadowed in my introduction, mix my metaphors a little bit and start thinking about the output of these recipes as paints rather than anything edible. Um, <clears throat> so we have our recipe, our shader, and it has spit out for us a bunch of painting materials, uh, literally referred to as materials, which can now be used in some way to render stuff to our screen. Here, we start to think of our video card like an artist, like an actual personified artist wanting to paint onto our screen as if it were a canvas. Uh, every time our artist video card wants to paint something to the screen, they have to dip their brush into their palette of paints, i.e. their materials, and then start laying down brush strokes. You can think of every new change of material like a change of paint that the, uh, on the artist's brush which then gets applied to whatever 3D geometry is up next to be rendered with that material. So each polygon on our mesh gets rendered with a single material as defined by whatever its shader recipe was. Now is probably a good time, as good a time as any, to point out that all game engines, they all come with their built-in shaders, like Unity has its standard shader, for example which is kind of aimed at being a good enough baseline to do the basic stuff. It's the dry, plain toast of shaders. If you limit yourself to only using these sort of step one basics off the shelf type stuff like this, then your graphics are going to be the plain dry toast of graphics. Everything is going to look samey and bland, no matter how good a texture artist you are, and no matter how much you push that basic dry toast, you can have very competently executed toast but at the end of the day, it's still toast. Okay, so now it's time to look at that object we want to render with our material. This is a gross oversimplification, but the vast majority of things that get rendered to the screen in a 3D game are made up of a big bag of triangles. And each triangle is made up of three vertices. In fact, it's more accurate to say that each 3D object is made up of a big bag of vertices, and then has a big list of triangles that sit there and go, okay, that vert, that vert, that vert, that's me, one, two, three. This distinction matters because it's the vertex data where all the action happens. Uh, at its core, all the shader is, and in turn the material that that shader spits out, um, is a way of taking a bunch of abstract data, like the data that defines our vertices, doing things to that data, and then using the results to define what color each pixel on the screen ends up getting lit up as. Okay, so now, halfway through this time slot is where I get to what the talk is really about. Um, but trust me, all that groundwork was needed because this talk is supposed to be about demystifying the big, bad, scary word shader and help people who otherwise might think, nah, that's too hard for me to actually get interested and involved because it's cool and fun. Um, because we live in an age now where the tools exist to allow literally anyone to dabble experimentally in an area that has historically been seen as one of the hardest, scariest parts of game dev and only uh, you know allowed to be entered by the highest level wizards. Um, but just like game engines have made it easy for anyone to have a crack at making video games without having to spend months first writing crap like input handlers and all that sort of stuff, um, we have tools now like Unity's Shader Graph and Unreal's Material Editor and even better third-party plugins that hide away all the hard stuff and basically go, okay, what do you want it to look like? Go nuts. Uh, this here on the screen at the moment is Amplify for Unity. It's what I personally use, and it is well worth the price. It is amazing, and if you're at all interested in this stuff, I highly recommend it. Uh, cool, so I hope everyone's with me so far. I know I've been speaking fast, um, but because this is where numbers start to get involved. So we have established that our shader takes a big bag of verts, does stuff to their data, and then turns that into colored pixels. So what is the data? that we get to mess around with. Well, each vertex has a bunch of number, a, a bunch of numbers that each define different things about it. Things like its X, Y, Z, its position in 3D space, number, number, number. Its color, red, green, blue, number, number, number. The direction it's facing in 3D space, it's normal, number, number, number. 
also binormal and tangent, which are mutually perpendicular vectors to the normal, but we'll just sort of gloss over for that for now. Um, we then also have zero or more pairs or triplets, but we'll gloss over that as well, of numbers defining lookup coordinates into the texture space. Uh, yes, you can have multiple UV coordinates in a single vertex and a bunch of other stuff too, but that's the important stuff for now. All right, so when we're going through the process of converting our big bag of vertex numbers to colored pixels, and by we, I mean the video card, we take our vertex data like position, color, whatever, and um, we know that those numbers define the exact value at the point that the vertex itself exists. But what about all the points in between? Well, they get interpolated from one vertex to the next. So you can see here in this diagram that the colors get inter uh, getting interpolated from red on this vertex to blue at this vertex, green at this vertex, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, while it is possible to make some pretty sweet art this way, just by setting the values per vertex, for example, uh, like these skyboxes from this old PS1 game, uh, there's a link to Twitter down the bottom there where I got this from if you want to go look it up. It's really interesting. Um, and this is all done with just vertex color, right? And the shape of the mesh itself creates the way the sky looks via the interpolation of uh, color from one vertex to the next. Um, you know, we can take this one step further, though, and that's where tex texture maps come in. Any value that defines a vertex can be, instead of simply interpolated from one vertex to the next, it can be mapped across the surface of the triangle using a texture. And each texel of the texture is responsible for representing that little square portion of the triangle surface, rather than that info coming from the verts themselves. Uh, because what is a texture at the end of the day? It's just a big grid of numbers, right? And those numbers can be used to represent whatever we want. Um, everyone's pretty familiar or like comfortable with the concept of like images being represented by their primary colors, red, green, and blue. Um, each of these colors being its own individual grid of numbers. Um, but you may not necessarily be used to thinking of it in terms of numbers. So let's have a quick look at like a little zoomed in part of this image. Um, here we can see on this close up from the previous slide uh, with each texel representing its value on a gray scale from zero to one where zero equals black and one equals white. Um, this is important to remember for later. You, generally, all of this stuff is um, like normalized numbers from zero to one. And knowing that will allow you to make, uh, you know, more meaningful decisions about what you do with these numbers later on. So, all right, here we can see, uh, sorry, this exact, exact same format of data, a big, 2D grid of three numbers. And you know you can call them RGB if you want. Um, it can also be used to map the surface direction of geometry, for example, which is what we call a normal map because it maps the surface normals. Uh, normal maps look all freaky colors like this in Photoshop because Photoshop's just interpreting those triplets of numbers as if they are red, green, and blue. But when those triplets of numbers are being used by the shader to represent surface normal, um, all it cares about is that there's three numbers and they are representing a direction in space, i.e. the normal of the surface. And that's what all this comes down to in the end, right? The fact that everything a computer does, even the instructions that it follows to do that stuff, boils down to being just a big long list of numbers being used in very complex and creative ways to represent different things. So what we choose to do with those numbers is totally up to us. All we need is enough of an understanding of how those numbers are going to get interpreted. So once we are comfortable thinking this way, that all our verts are just big lists of numbers that mean different things to the video card, and that each point on the surface of our triangles between the verts are also defined by those numbers, either by interpolating the vert values or being mapped from a texture or some combination of the two, then we realize that every pixel of every frame of every video game lights up the color that it does because of the specific recipe 
that was followed to create that particular hamburger of numbers. So now, armed with this newfound confidence, you can really start to wield this knowledge with power and start to experiment. If everything is just numbers, what happens if we start adding some of those numbers together or multiplying them together or swap one for the other? Just like there's no limit to numbers themselves, there's no limit to the operations you can perform on those numbers either. I mean, within reason, of course, performance is a consideration, but it's not the focus of this talk. And that was a really long walk to get to this point, but I think it was an important walk to take because it's hard to mess around and try things out when you don't really know what you're looking at or what to even mess around with. Um, but it's also important because it's so easy to think that because shaders are also where relatively hardcore calculations can be taking place, uh, like what we're talking about today is really simple stuff. But once you fall down this rabbit hole, expect to see along the way vectors, matrices, some calculus, a lot of trigonometry, um, and once more for good luck, vectors. So that combined with the fact that looking at shader code can really feel like you are just looking straight into the matrix, it's easy to feel like all shader work is best left to the programmers, right? Um, also, shadertoy.com, um, definitely go look it up if you're interested in this stuff. Okay, not just for the programmers, or rather, you know, not entirely. As mentioned, the shader authoring tools that we have access to these days are so easy to pick up and use, you can just jump straight into the creative part of shader creation and not have to wade through the equivalent of learning the Moonlight Sonata first just to play Mary Had a Little Lamb. So if we jump over to Photoshop now for a second, um, and I'm gonna do this as quickly as we can, we can have a look at how textures are just a big grid of numbers that we can do maths on, except that the maths end up, ends up outputting pretty colors. All right, so if we have a quick look at this texture here in Photoshop, so this is, um, you know, just a, you know, clouds generated from Photoshop itself. And if we have a look right up close, we can see each texel is showing up as gray on the screen. If we have a look at the channels, it's made up of red, green, and blue. And the output pixel is gray because the red, green, and blue channels are the same um, in each location on the texture. If we were to change one of these channels, and I'm just gonna like, you know, hit this with a sledgehammer pretty much. If we totally change the values in one of those channels, then the uh, resultant um, color is going to be totally different. So uh, here's one I cooked earlier. All I did on this one was render clouds and um, you know offset the pixels a little bit so that their values no longer corresponded, red, green, and blue being identical on each texel. And now we get this like rainbow paddle pop looking color because you know it, each value has you know totally different R, G, and B. So if we now take this over to Unity real quick and slap this on a material that's using a custom shader, the custom shader is not really doing anything at the moment. Um, it's just applying that texture as it is. Cool, we've got some pretty colors there. If we have a look at, uh, I've set some stuff up here that's gonna make it real easy to plug together some examples. At the moment, we've just got this rainbow paddle pop texture plugging straight into the albedo, which is, you know, the fancy word for color. Um, I'm not getting into the definition of albedo, just think of it as color. Um, that's all it's doing at the moment. But we've got another texture sitting here, which, you know, as we've already discussed, just a big grid of numbers. This is also a big grid of numbers. What happens if we add these two sets of numbers together and then we spit that out into the color. Rebuild the shader, have a look over here. We can see now, we can definitely see the rocks in that, and we can also see the rainbow paddle pop in that, but it's a lot brighter than either of the original textures. And that's because um, if we think back to the slide that showed the grayscale values from zero to one, uh, what we're doing here is on each individual texel, we're adding the numbers together. So when you add two numbers together, they get bigger, they get closer to one, therefore they get brighter. If we go over and multiply those two numbers together, instead of adding them together, then have a look at the output of that. 
we will see a totally different result. We can still see the shape of the rocks in there. We can still see the rainbow paddle pop, but it's now a lot darker than the original textures because if we think back to the types of numbers that we're working with, they're all in the range from zero to one. So you multiply 0 0.5 by 0 0.5, it's gonna be 0.25. A smaller number, a number closer to zero, it's gonna be darker. So that's why multiplying numbers together makes them darker. And I'm now gonna skip ahead like a thousand steps and um, do something crazy. Take the red and green channels of this texture and chuck them into the UV coordinates of the rock texture here. And let's see what that looks like. It certainly doesn't look like rock anymore. Um, it doesn't really look like anything that you might see in real life, but that's not the point. That's certainly not the point of this talk. Um, I feel like it's maybe a little bit of a uh, like a, a, a misguided hunt for the Holy Grail to only be pursuing perfect realism in your visuals or any element of game dev for that matter, but especially your visuals. There's so much more you can do creatively if you just experiment and just like see what happens. Um, so let's take this one final step further and Let's also, as well as using these texture values as UV coordinates for another texture, let's also offset them by time as well. So, uh, whoops, didn't rebuild the shader there. Come on, Unity, no respect for time. All right, so now we can see that's, I mean, it doesn't look like anything from real life, not that I've seen anyway, but it looks pretty damn cool, right? And this is just with like two seconds of experimenting and playing around. If you just went, I'm going to set aside a weekend and just see what kind of wacky crap I can do. Man, I, I'd love to see what you came up with. I don't know why I'm bringing that back. I'm done with shaders for now. Um, all right, so let's get rid of Unity and let's wrap this thing up because we're definitely getting down to the wire. So uh, slides, where have you gone? Uh, slides, where are you? There we go. So... Um, Everything in a computer is all just numbers, right? They can represent anything you want. You know what else in video games is all just numbers? Well, everything. But uh, you know what is part of that everything? Sound. Now, this is a tiny slight tangent to end on because uh, it has nothing to do with shaders, but it is a bit of a fun little demonstration I like to do with my class when we're talking about this stuff. Um, if textures are all just numbers and sound waves are all just numbers, what happens if you play a texture as a sound? Um, so this is the clouds texture that I just had open in Photoshop, um, opened here in an audio editor. Uh, now, unfortunately, you're gonna have to settle for a screenshot because even after like an hour of faffing around <laughs> during the tech setup prior to the conference, we couldn't get this to actually play properly over the stream. So I'm, I'm unable to play it for you right now, but if you want to try and imagine what it sounds like, it's kind of like uh, if a transformer was trying to yodel the sound of uh, vinyl record skipping. Anyway, there's no reason you can't just go and try this out for yourself and you know experiment and see what it sounds like. Um, uncompressed files work the best if you want to play them as audio. Uh, compressed stuff like JPEGs, don't waste your time, it's just white noise. I find that for whatever reason, DLLs, sound extremely interesting but be careful obviously don't just open up a windows dll put reverb on it and then save it again or something i will not be held responsible for the consequences of you doing that um all right so if there is any time left at all oh crap uh sorry i really forgot to mention that on these final slides there is a uh, uh, <laughs> photosensitivity warning so if you are at all photosensitive, please look away now. And hopefully uh, you weren't paying attention when I accidentally skipped ahead too early there. Um, but the final slides on this presentation are just a few examples of some of the work that I've done in the past that I find most interesting visually, um, especially this first slide, which is focused more heavily on the just experimenting and going wild kind of stuff where I didn't have any particular end result in mind. I was just sort of, you know, seeing what I could do. 
Um, on this slide here, uh, I will call out one of these GIFs in particular, the bottom left one there. Um, that was from a music film clip that I was working on a few years ago. That um, So what you're seeing there in that GIF, the colors of, of, of uh, you know, each of those little squares and stuff, and the UVs, how they're sort of changing from frame to frame, all of that was being generated from the actual waveform of the audio track itself that this was playing in time to. So kind of the reverse thing that I was showing there with the waveform. Um, all right, what else have we got on here? Oh, I, I could spend half an hour talking about each of these shaders individually. So you'll just have to look at them. If you've got any questions, ask me in the Discord or whatever. Um, I've also got my Twitter at the end if you want to hit me up and I could just talk shaders forever. It's you know, the easiest way to get me to not shut up, which is pretty easy anyway. Um, yeah, more stuff. Uh, game I'm currently working on at the moment. This doesn't look like there's much terribly interesting going on with the shaders, but uh, there's, there's some cool stuff going on behind the scenes. And last year, you may be aware, I worked on a game about a cat, a magical cat. And uh, one of the things that we really wanted to sort of like get happening with this character is like um, for, its, for it to look like this sort of like ethereal, inky, blotty, magicalness. Also, during the game, you can totally change the way that the cat looks. So, you know, we went kind of crazy with cool stuff like that. Um, I can't take credit for the three on the left here with the black background. Credit goes to Michael Brown for those. Uh, but I included them anyway because they just look so freaking cool. Um, and that's it from me. How did I go for time? Oh, so close. Um, so just to, you know, totally finally wrap up, um, I hope this talk has inspired you to get out there and experiment and not be afraid of the technical aspects of things. Anything can be as creatively facilitating as oil paints if you just look at it from the right point of view and with the right attitude. Uh, that's it for me. Believe in yourself. Go make cool things. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Shane. That was an amazing, amazing talk. Um, and Thanks, I'll Shane. never forget the image of you uh, in a playground uh, broken down into your <laughs> RGB values.